Conference, your source for JVM knowledge. getting what you want out of it, please go, I won't be offended. <laughs> and feel free to try to jump in on someone else, things like that. All of the all the materials will be posted online as well, so if you feel the pace isn't good for you right now, it will be available later as well. And I'm available on Twitter, at BeckJ01, and I usually respond. Uh, it's been a little bit busy lately, but I will try if you have questions, and I'm happy to try and help whenever. If you haven't done it already, uh, go to this link, the Bitly Breach Workshop with Capital W and Clone the Repo. Uh, just do that as we start talking and you'll catch up. Okay. Uh, this assumes everyone has a uh, working Docker, uh, just for the quality infrastructure and JDK 8. Everything else should be for you in there. And if it's not, we'll fix it. And then you get into a pull request because it's open source. So our agenda, <laughs> we're going to go through a short intro, and this is, we're going to do hopefully four labs. Uh, you're the first major group through, so timing-wise, we, th we think we'll hit it right, but if not, we'll, like I said, it'll be open source. Uh, logging, uh, we're going to go through a lab that's all about getting connected logging and all the more advanced logging use cases that you really need to have in a microservice infrastructure to really get true observability. And then we're going to move into uh, tr distributed tracing. We're going to start with a little bit of tracing terminology, kind of go through what it means so we can all use the same terms. And then after that, uh, we'll do a little bit of metrics, uh, and that one will be a little bit more talking because to get the true value of metrics, it's a lot about putting them in place, but then also understanding your business use cases, which I wasn't able to recreate in our little sandbox today. And uh, lab four is a handful of observability bugs that I've injected that you get to debug in the, which are either really hard or really easy. Uh, We'll see which ones they are, and we can adjust from there. We'll do some other interesting things. So, who am I? I'm Jeff Beck. Uh, I do uh, software at SmartThings. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of Samsung. So I do home IoT for uh, Samsung, basically. Been doing it for about four, a little over four years. Uh, we went from about five services when I started <laughs> And we're north of 150 microservices running in production right now, uh, with the goal to get it to be where we can deploy services from zero code to prod in about a day or less. So we expect the number of services to keep growing, and we expect services to cycle out as well. So we, we got a pretty high churn environment, and because of that, it's really hard to reason about 150 microservices in your head. There's only a handful of people in the company that even can attempt to name half of the services. And the goal is to make that okay. So, how the workshop is set up. Uh, labs are in a state where they will compile, but they are not 100% correct. So they should work individually, but the emergent behavior from, the, from them sh will not be working. Uh, so each individual service is probably okay-ish. Then when we talk about the broader system, it won't work. The, the answers for everything is in the other folder called like lab one answers. Don't jump ahead uh, unless you just are interested in seeing the answers quick and not really doing hands-on bit. And if that's the case, 
I hope you find a lot of answers in here, but then take your time to go to another workshop that you can take hands on experiences as well, because I think you'll get a lot more out of that. We also have an infrastructure folder. This, uh, if you're in the, if you has everyone gotten the repo to clone? Does anyone still need the link again? It's okay if you do. You blink? Okay. Good? Can you put the link, please? If I just make it bigger. <laughs> That's useful. Yeah, clone that whole repo. And then that whole repo will have everything in it. So it's bit.ly slash breach workshop with a capital W. Right. Within each lab, there's a task list. The task list is what you're uh, trying to accomplish. The, the feel free to do pairs if people want a pair program. If you want help at any point, raise your hand. I'll come by. It, it's all about kind of doing this on your own a little bit. Uh, I have some hints. We'll talk through more hints as people kind of go through and see where people are getting stuff. We'll add more hints and things like that. And then after we, majority of us finish the lab, we're gonna do a little bit of wrap up because a lot of the topics that we're learning are really the basic way of doing things. And then I will talk you through the more advanced use cases which are the same basic fundamentals and tools just apply to bigger scenarios or across many services to get like all of the tools we use if applied consistently scale really well to help. And I can talk through that. And hopefully people can bring in their their pain points and their own experiences as well as those discussions. I got asked this enough when I wrote this topic. I thought I would explain what I think observability is. Uh, to me, it's all about allowing the system to be in a state where all of us operators can understand what's happening. Uh, and that's not just from like a this we're using this much CPU, we're using this much uh, memory, it's observability from, it does the business process function work? Do most of my customers get what they need? And eventually driving business metrics from that same observability to then tell you what features need to be removed, potentially. Like if you have an unused feature, you remove it instead of maintaining it. You can do all of those benefits way down the line. We're not there yet. That's our dream of ours too. So don't, don't fear. if anyone's got that, come up here and share. All right. Lab one, log in. If you haven't already, uh, apparently Zoom doesn't work anymore. Oh, it's not terribly small. In the infra directory, please do Docker compose up. If you don't want to watch the logs, you can add the dash D at the end. But this will stand up a Elkstack, Zipkin, Prometheus, and uh, one more, Grafana. Yes. And if you're wondering about all of those, there is an, there's a links.html uh, file right in the root of the project you can open that should have links to all of those. Once Dr. Pozoff works, it should be good. Is everyone downloading the internet right now? Or yeah. Okay. <laughs> we should just <laughs> Yeah, depending on what you already have. I used all public <laughs> images best I could. So there's things you should have ran across before. And I didn't custom compile all the images. I just recently <laughs> so I'm kind of okay. Uh, make sure no one has work proxies going back to different countries. So once that is done, uh, even before it's done, if you'd like, you can go in to any of the apps in Lab One, uh, and you can run them. There's two different commands. 
And if you go to the user Grails directory, that's going to be a user service written in Grails, uh, Grails 4. And we've got some, in the tasks, you'll see there's some, an interesting caveat that I ran into upgrading to Milestone 2 last night, and I couldn't solve it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, if someone wants to figure that problem out, I'd love to have it. Uh, but basically, you're going to do a uh, Gradle boot run, uh, just B-O-R-U, if you want, because I think it sounds fun. All the other projects are Micronaut and Ratpack. So if you go into any of them, uh, you can do a, a Gradle, just a standard Gradle run. I find it a lot easier to go all the way into the folder. So let's show one of these. So if we go into lab one. Is that readable or bigger? It's okay. <coughs> so if we go into Edge, so we can just do Gradle Run, and this will should start everything out fine. And all four of these are set up to run on different ports, so you, you shouldn't have any conflicts running all four of them, plus your Docker Compose. At this point, I'm going to let you all kind of go down the test list a little bit. Uh, if someone gets through, let's see, I'll pull it. So the test list looks like this. When someone gets through this get logs to one place step, just kind of raise your hand so I get a sense of how fast we're moving. And if it seems like no one knows where to start, let me know and I can we can give you a little more hints. But there are some hints in uh, in here uh, about what you should be doing. All uh, dependencies and everything's set up. All the projects are set up, so all you're really doing is if you have to add a new dependency or things like that. In this case, we're talking about trying to deliver all of our logs to uh, Logstash. And so the easiest way to do that is with uh, a special <coughs> appender in the SLF for J. So the logs are, the logback config is the place to start. So logback XML. And we're just downloading still, right? <laughs> While we're downloading, if anyone wants to ask any sort of questions about Microservices at scale, observability, what like things we've experienced at, at Smart Things, my company, or I've run across, I'm happy to answer them. Where do you it's in each lab. So if you go to lab, uh, instead of saying it. So if you start in the observability workshop, you go into lab one. <laughs> there will be a tasks.adoc that you can open. And there should be one of those in every lab that kind of gives you the, the steps. Like I said, this is something that if you wanted to do on your own, you can get through it or whatever, totally do that. And there's nothing, there's no reason you can't start working on your projects and making sure they all run before the Docker Compose is up. Docker Compose is only for the log aggregation and Zipkin and all the observability stuff. All of the project dependencies themselves are housed within them. So I used the memory databases and things like that. Still forever to run the because I'm downloading all this. Yep. I guess going to Grails. <laughs> you can do the rat pack one. That's probably small. Or oh, the micronaut one's really small. You can start with that one. I can tell you it's still uh, importing the project. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, I. That's why you should go Vim. 
I have a double J. Oh, it works fine. Hey, I just had to give it. I mean, I gave it extra memory a long time ago. So. <laughs> Are you okay if I just watch you what you think you know, that's what Yeah, but I mean, we'll just pair program. Right now, it's like, my intelligence is stuff It's all random stuff before I want to show you your project. I'm just tethering to that. I consider doing that one. So there's an easy way to fix it. I, I'm guessing it's my problem because I think it has to do with the multi-project build. Uh, I kind of abused Gradle a little bit. If you if you didn't notice, uh, the, the build files are kind of injected from the base into all of the repeated files so that when we do updates, we can do them in one place and it hits all, all the labs. <coughs> Oh, we're just 
would you have it? Um, seems to be complaining about a quarter of eight but there is no issue. Yeah. Yeah. All my complainers. And, oh, I don't know. Okay. As you say, the list, I have the list of forms. Yeah, I don't think it's something else that's running for someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which point is it? So you going to want to look for a, a sock defender. So 
you can either like step it back with the dot double dots, or you can do that and tell it exactly where it goes. If you have it locally, it's a little easier. You're probably not with dot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's still going. Yeah, all four of them eventually, but you can let that go. It's gonna do a bunch of. Uh, there's two wrap back ones, so we'll download the same stuff. Okay. Okay, both doing good. Yeah. Same computer because you just turn on the Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I thought the only no, 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 way is for there's a long back. There's one in every project. That you'll have to. So the Grails one is different. The main, because it's the J, the groovy one, whereas the other two are just XML. It's, it's a little bit the same. But you want to look for a socket appender. You can start the Gradle too if you want. Okay. Oh, good. So you could actually start working on getting the the log appender to in uh, log back because by the time you get that working, hopefully Docker will be up because Docker is just the thing it's going to send it to. <laughs> That's the edge. You got it working. <laughs> So you can you can go all the way back if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, like we can actually we can actually go back at all. Or you can go forward. Yeah, so if you want, you can either do all the dots, create a you, and it's all great. Or, when you want it with the grill CLI. Yeah, I don't know how to use that. Okay. <laughs> it works with Gradle. Uh, Gradle um, with cat uh yarn pulling up. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why the Grail CLI is broken, but, but uh, it's at the root of the, of the project. So you can you can actually reference it from the root uh, or use it directly. So if you go to you finding anything or no? Okay. I don't want you to go too far in the weeds. You are. Uh, so you should be able to do
is right now directly. Yeah, that works fine. Uh, that's, uh, you can also go from the remove project. Mm -hmm. If you change the logger, the continuous mode does not pick it up. Okay. And it doesn't pick up rat pack that group. Okay. Changes the best that I can tell. <coughs> I'm sure it's just something I did wrong in the configuration of rat pack. as well from the root. Yeah, my grail is broken. Uh, I updated my kernel like two days ago, so that's not a lot. Grail works for me. <laughs> it's because I'm always a short. They made a new version that really doesn't even use RAM now. They don't have the 16 gig anymore. So what you're saying? I was going to say, you know, this stuff that develops. Yeah. 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 It's, it's basically 
magical threat level that gets propagated somehow. No, no one honestly knows how to do it. <laughs> if, someone, if someone understands MDC in here, they can jump up and explain it because it kind of it works with thread locals and somehow it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we hook into the uh, hook into the longer uh, MPC interceptor and put it off the registry for you and take it back off. <laughs> so, but this is where things that seem simple have a ton of prerequisites. So part of this whole experience is really shows if you're starting from zero on your project, how much work you have to put into observability to make anything work. This was kind of enlightening to me because I come from a place where we expect out of the box to get aggregated logging, metrics, monitoring, all of that is just supposed to happen automatically. And so I came, I was like, okay, this is all the stuff we want. How do you set it all up from scratch if you, you're starting it? It's a lot. That's why the entire infrastructure is set up for you once the internet downloads. So if anyone is getting to the point where they want to know whether or not their, their logs are really going in, you want to go to the Kibana link, and that should have everything in there. It, there is a slight lag for it to get in. Not, not like minutes, but it's not instantaneous. Sorry. I'm just careful. <laughs> did you restart? How did you restart the app? Oh, yeah, that's fine. The doctor, though? <laughs> It should have been fine. It looks like it didn't create one of the indexes, though. So if we go, uh, go into Gibbon. Here's just slow. <laughs> <laughs> it's still online. It's still online. It's still and then switch Yeah, 
Some people that are not seeing all of the indexes created. If that happens to you, if you go in and it says you don't have any indexes, what you can do is you can go in to this create index, this curl command right here, and just go ahead and grab that and run it, but just change out right here where it says Kibana to 127.0.0.1. If you have if, if it doesn't yell at you for not having an index, you're fine and work correctly. I think it has something to do with how slow some of the things are downloading, because there's a little Docker container that just has curl on it that runs this script, and it should have worked, but if it didn't, I guess the retry wasn't enough.
Yeah, it's just me being fucked up. Alright, you are in... I don't know what that is. Grafana. Yes. Yes. You're in Grafana. Grafana is for Web 2. <laughs> All of them should start. So everything starts at once. So if you go back to the links.html uh, page, it's in the root of the project. So go to a terminal. Yeah. New tab. Go into the project folder. Uh, uh, go up a level. And then do uh, open links. No, no, if you do open it, it should open in your browser. Mm -hmm. If you can, you can try open it. Command open. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Cabana should have this. Yep. That one should have a lot of working. Right now. So, so I'm going to discover. Let's see. It's got logs. Yeah. So you were having the same problem that everyone is. I don't know why. That's great. But there's a curl command you can run to fix this. So if you open up your project. Anywhere I can see this. That works. Uh, oh, you you open individuals. Open the infra. Yep. Alright, in there, under Kibana, there's a batch script called Train Index. So if you can take that curl command that's inside the if and just run that change Kibana to 127001 and then run that locally and it should work. Oh, that's new. Never seen that before. Look, okay, I'm missing out. Uh, 127. The whole doesn't work on it. There it goes. Yep, run that curl.
Okay, let's try. Uh, can we try? Are we in the infrared? Cancel that. Let's try something else. Try the doctor way. <laughs> Alright, go into the infrared. Yes, it went to the infrared. Alright, so doctor compose. Uh, dash compose. Up, space. Okay. Um, no. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Uh, can you open the project uh, again? Because I don't know the. Oh, can you tab? Does tab complete work? Yeah, try to tab. We want. You have a new open Okay, that one worked. So now, if you go back and go on it, if you refresh this page, it should be on the Still young. No, it, it'll pick it up. Oh. It index patterns? It should pick, it'll pick it up automatically as soon as it's in, but it's not. Okay. Something is very weird. Oh. <coughs> so, we can just do it. Uh, this might not show up until you send some data to it. Okay. That's why. You have to send. Have you set up your socket offender yet? Try that. This looks close. Um, I think we have to make sure we send some data first from one of the offenders. I think I'm going to go ahead and show that now for everyone. I think you're really close. We'll try this and then. Yeah, which one has to be. Yeah, that's right. That should work if you have the logging offender in the log back. Remember the logger too. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to show the first part of this to show how you get the logs actually flowing in. I'm going to show a rat pack one because it's a little more approachable than the Grails one. We can then jump over it and do the Grails one if you want. You have gotten how far? Not so much. <laughs> uh, he's got uh, he's got the dynamic logging down, right? Well, kind of. But yeah. You can do that <laughs> well, look at IntelliJ. And yeah. you would like to see the answer or follow the log. It's too small. If you just look at the log back. really hard to read. So what you will want to set up is this log back TCP socket adapter. Uh, so it's log stash TCP socket adapter for log back. And then you're going to set up a destination. And the destination is going to be your loop back and 4560, because that's defined as like the standard port for log stash. And that's what's available. Once you have that and you put some sort of encoder in here, uh, that, yeah, you you did the next steps. You two had, had actually gone past the next steps. So you did the harder things. <laughs> uh, so this is how you would get it in. And then you have to have this. Everything below there is 
the more advanced next step tasks in the in the thing. So if everyone wants to try to get this much working with the, the log stash, and let's make sure that your combine and everything's working, and then we'll do uh, we'll I'll walk through the rest of these quickly. Does that does that help everyone? Were they a little stuck on how to actually get the logs to Logstash, or did you get it? Okay. Oh, okay. Does it show up in Kibana? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure it got everything in the super interesting ways check. See. Also, I, I will have to say that it, at, in production in my company, we pay for Sumo Logic and Datadog. So we don't run these things because they're hard to run, especially at scale. You need them, they're important, but the techniques you learn work across any tool. Spawn if you have the money for it. Yeah, it's there. But I'm not sure I got it. Uh, let me see uh, the grass. The other. Can you tell me part? I could. <laughs> Wait, I only have the right one. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that should have first. That's uh, task three. Oh, uh, uh, item three in the list is to deal with that problem of why you can't. Yeah, okay, of course. Because you need to do something. Need to do something. So, so yeah, down below there, there's, there's there's basically the add static keys to the encoder. So if you do something like that, it's a really nice way to make sure you know what we're doing. So what we do in our system in production is all we do append a special like service name for every service. So we know always what service is recording those logs because we want to have a little more like controllability than just uh, and uh, every every system and subsystem has unique uh, identifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, GUI is yeah. so pretty easy to to uh, yeah to know exactly where. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, we actually took it the next step further, and what we started to do is in our logging systems, we start extracting uh, service names. Uh, we started extra extracting service names. And what we do with that is we aggregate those with big if statements into constellations. So you can we'll inject a new uh, field into our logs that says what constellation the apps are part of. So like our off constellation may have five services in it, and then we'll aggregate those together so that you can dashboard just your off services instead of having to maintain the list. Because like I said, we have so many microservices they actually cycle out now. So we replace them quite frequently, and we don't want to update our da our like dashboards. So then you build this like second level of re interaction in your logging system to deal with that. So what has come up a little bit is people asking, how do I tell what logs are from where once they get into Kibana? And that's where. Looking at this uh, custom fields is where we can add this app. I'm adding an app key that will show up in all of my logs then. And I, I'm just happy to set that to app edge. Yes? Send some more logs there. It's usually what that one is. I don't know if I can 
So, I think it's time that we go ahead and show a little bit more of what's next in the task list. So the task list I have right here. The first one was all about just getting your logs into somewhere. Uh, we're using the Elk stack, so that's uh, log stash. Uh, is all set up so it actually goes into the Elk stack. It should all work. I know we've had a few problems with that, so we'll try to improve that a little bit. Now we know how to set up our, our app so that we can go ahead and get things in there. The next one is about dynamic log filtering. So the next thing that happens is immediately you, you get really excited and you push all of your logs, just 100% logging everywhere, every level into Kibana or whatever you're using, and then you get the fill and you have to reduce your logging. Um, so that, that is currently one of my projects at work is reducing logging. And the problem with that is you can't, across the board, just turn everything off because then you lose the whole idea of observability. So what, what a nice thing to do is look at this idea of dynamic threshold filters. It's a turbo filter from Logback. It allows you to dynamically choose what level to log at. So you don't have to change the config. You can have it be driven by data in your app. And in particular, it's driven by MVC. So that's you and your app can then push data into MVC and, and set up whatever you like. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. I know some people have got it kind of working. So I want to show you what I, the pattern I like. And this is, this is where it gets to be a lot of personal preference. And I'm going to tell you why I think this is a good idea. Uh, and then you can tell me why it's a bad idea. Uh, that's the kind of back and forth we have. What you're going to do is set up a turbo filter. Now, a turbo filter is happening after the appenders, but before the root level. I am not 100% sure if that matters, but it works this way, so I have never changed it. <laughs> Let's just be honest. It's, it's defined what the programming is. Yeah. <laughs> it works that way too. Yeah, never touch the order in XML is what I've learned in my career. Uh, the class that is the dynamic threshold filter, I talked that about that a little bit in the task. You did have to look it up and find it. The key in this case is anything in NBC. So you, were, you all were taking the approach of looking for something like a user ID or something like that. Now, that's, that's good if you know that user ID is, user IDs are low cardinality and you always want that high logging. What I like to do is looking at, uh, what I use is a dynamic log level. So I will put in a field into MDC, something like, uh, with the key dynamic log level, and then just put the level that I wanted at, and then use that to be the, the logging level. So it allows me to go to like, in, it defaults to info, because that's my standard practice, everything's in info. Debug and trace are special cases. So then per request, I actually accept a header, look for all the headers, and then add that to MDC, and push it, and push it down in there. So it allows me to say, if I'm having a, a test, a queue, an automated test from a SDAT, a, a software engineering test, they can add these logging headers to their automated tests so that throughout the entire system, because we propagate this down the line, we can get debug level tracing just for the test runs. Or we can actually go the opposite way and say, we don't want that because you run way too much tests, so we're gonna like bump up the other direction. It's kind of whatever works for your like use case. Like for us, synthetic load is so low volume compared to mainline production traffic. We always want that to be 100%, 100% traced, 100% logged. Everything we can do at 100, we want that. Uh, and then, like anything that's on our event pipeline, we we actually try to sample. We don't even do 100% logging of info. We'll actually do sampling beyond that. So as the next thing to do is these turbo filters are very configurable. 
And you can make your own turbo filters. So what we've done is, as a way of approaching this, is say we'll do an automated sample rate. And say we're only going to sample 10% of logs that come through this filter. Instead of having to put all of that logic into your app, you can keep it down in your loggers, and it's way more reusable across your microservices. And it doesn't tend to interact with the different frameworks. And then the very bottom, you have to have both uh, appenders. If you miss that, you won't get any logs out. <laughs> the other, other one that's really interesting is this custom fields. This is where we set a custom field to make sure we always have something in our logging. At this point, I think it's best if you feel that you got everything running in the infra and you want to try it, go ahead and try running the lab one answers. Just you can run them all. And then some commands. Put them in the, I want to say, let's double check before I tell you they're not there. <laughs> so some example posts to make. Uh, if you want to look at what the service looks like, I'm going to cheat a little bit and show you what this is what will come out of <coughs> lab two. Uh oh. Oh, there it is. Just a little. So you'll see that this is the dependency graph that's actually built up in these services. So the way it works is everything's going to come into the edge service. And then it actually has proxies to, to the report, Micronaut, uh, and to the hub, and this little thing, which is our lab two, and I don't want to talk about it. Uh, I think we're at a point where it's good to take a minute to take a break, go to the bathroom, whatever you want, and then we'll jump in to uh, lab two. So if anyone wants to run lab one answers with me, I'm going to stay here and come up. We can do it. I can run it up here if people want. Whatever people want to see, and we'll wrap. We'll call lab one wrapped up. If anyone has other questions, ask them. We'll talk about it. Say start lab two in what? Ten minutes? Five minutes? Ten? <laughs> Ten. Yeah. Uh, that one. Does anyone need help running Lab One Answers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could try stopping doing Dr. Bowman stop. No, the other applications, the way they connect, don't So Zipkin is a distributed tracing that we'll talk about. So Zipkin is the next thing. I just wanted to jump ahead and show you what the dependencies look like. Because that's one of the things you do is show you the dependencies. 
it, like if you can log every 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 transaction and do everything, you should totally do that. But if you can do that at scale and keep your costs down, you probably should be in a business that just sells that feature. Because it's really hard. And people like Sumo and Splunk and uh, New Relic, you were saying, are all in this space. So it's all options out there. Uh, formatting matters. Uh, this is where adding a little something to say what service it came from matters a lot. Making sure that we're formatting, because we said we are doing a certain encoder to make sure we sent it through to Logstash so it showed up in Toronto well. Uh, if you're using a hosted uh, service and you're at scale, we generate 13 terabytes of logs a day right now. And uh, that's with heavy filtering and sampling. So because of that, small changes like it's, it's annoying, but switching from a whole word to a letter actually saves you money. So you have to do things like that. All right. Any questions about the kind of stuff we talked about for logging? Let two tracing. So we got correlation IDs working, or you looked at the lab, the answer and got it working. That that's almost tracing, but it's not that detailed yet. So what is distributed tracing? It's, it's all about collecting end-to-end -end latency graphs, so the whole graph, uh, in a near real time. And some major players are Zipkin, Jaeger, uh, the Dapper paper is the famous paper that does it. Uh, you have Lightstep, New Relic, I believe, has one of these. A whole bunch of people are getting into this space right now. I'm going to put on my, like, I don't nudge often, but I would nudge you towards Zipkin. It's open source, it's well maintained, and it's really like approachable. But that's it. That, that's my. If you can afford a vendor, probably use a vendor because this is not your core business. Terminology. When we talk distributed tracing, it has a very unique way of talking about everything. A span is the thing that took place. The event is something that's in the span. It's also sometimes called an annotation. Tag is exactly what you think it is. It's a tag on a span. The trace is the end-to-end -end graph. Tracer is the actual library. And then instrumentation is the use of the tracker in your own library. And then you'll also hear the, the term sample percentage a lot. And that's all about just how often to record a trace. Uh, what we have moved towards is doing 100% tracing in dev and staging, and then we'll do like 1% tracing in production, except for offflows. Uh, during OAuth flows, we actually do 100% tracing because we care a whole lot about that. And then we also do some, you can do clever things if you control the data flowing to an outside system and back, which you do in OAuth. So you can actually embed the trace, the trace ID and pick up the span and know how long it took on the other people's system. So if you control the inbound and outbound data like a loop through a system, you can use distributed tracing to actually like measure the outside latency. Same maps. Everything should look really familiar. If you're in lab two right now, it should have all the answers from the lab one answers. So all of that should be there, if I did it right. Uh, what we're doing now is we're adding Zipkin tracing to everything. So where if you look at some of how we had to make correlation IDs work, you'll look at Micronaut, I'm going to like put on a pedestal right now, Micronaut has amazing tracing support built into the entire system. And it's, I would, if you want like low hanging fruit, start with the, the Micronaut integration uh, for open tracing and everything. It's really, it's really easy to get work done. Yep. And go. <laughs> uh, once again, the tasks should have hints in it. The tasks.ascme.com has like basically tells you the class names to look for and what you're looking to actually do. I know, I'm just asking you. <laughs> I'm 
The way to tell if what you did is working is to go to the, the Zipkin UI and you'll start seeing services appear in the drop down and you'll be able to search for them. So the nice, the, the nice slash bad way about AAM is it's going to like instrument the code for you. And so you, it's going to do distributed tracing by injecting at like the bytecode level. And you don't need control of what it put over it as much. That's really nice because you can like toss it in on the existing projects. Where I personally, I'm a control freak and I want to be so I can show you this off uh, where we have a uh, near cache and a far cache and then an upstream service. And so we have all of those in the distributed trace and it shows timings for the near cache department. Like everything. And you don't get that with APM. Yeah, it's more of a new And then we also have the like instrument routing on which country it goes to because we, we do the objects versus the country that's wrong. So, so it, what it is is if you connect to a uh, Samsung, uh, Samsung account, when you sign up, your data is hosted in the country you sign up in because that's where you're from. So then when you create credentials to log in in the US and you're from here, we actually have to call that number to get to do an object. And so then we have to then bifurcate all our metrics based on if we're going to cross ocean calls or not. Because we expect the P99 of those calls to be different than the P99 of all the calls. So then we have to do like all the yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I think it would also have a custom way to do it. Well, if you, like I said, you wrote great. All the vendors are great. If, you, if they're in your price point, you just want to be like, yeah, it's great. Uh, everything you learn doing the Zipkin stuff will transfer, though, because getting the sense of how this works is very, very much the same. I am not here, so. You should give it more, but I don't know how. To topple it. How that goes to topple, right? Yeah. I don't. Okay, so this is where. Uh, can you type Docker stats? Oh, uh, so, yeah, Docker stats. Yeah, it should be like the first thing. Oh, you're using that for sure. So that's what we have to They all have one one gig of it. Yeah, so whatever it is thinks it only has one gig to work in. For what? Right, but it thinks it has a, a one gig total to work with across all the services. And I don't know why. Yeah, so it's like 
Well, it should be showing up now. If you run that too, you can start seeing some show up. <laughs> if not, it's not your fault. It's something went wrong with the infrastructure. And the goal is not for you to have to learn the infrastructure. The goal is to learn like the processes, but you have to have the entire infrastructure. Okay. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Uh, can you refresh this page? Yeah. Try refreshing the whatever that is. Shift or Yeah, that's good. 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 That will start showing things when it's working. When, zip, when you have Zipkin working on, all of them, on some of them, they'll start showing up right there. That's the easy way to check it. <laughs> <laughs> Me dijo que la mejor forma de probarlo es este, aquí debería salir este el, 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 el. So I, I know this has been challenging. I hope that just having this like playground of infrastructure is something that you can use in the future to kind of like test out concepts and play with them a little bit. If it's not at all useful to you and you feel like we're missing something huge, let me know. Uh, I want to keep improving and keep delivering. <laughs> so just always let me know. If you want, yes. So I can include that. If you go to, if you have all the apps running and you go to uh, Git on Hubs, that this will hit the edge service, and then that will proxy to the Hub Graphic service. Uh, slash users does a user list, and slash reports does a report. I believe. If you want to start driving traffic through there. <laughs> The, the best thing is if you hit super stuck uh, you should see it uh it zip can hit multiple things. So we should connect so, cool, yeah, that would be really nice. So, are you hitting <laughs> this service first? Uh, yeah, Which service are you on? Are you hitting Micronaut first? Yes, yes, it's the 128. It's called the plug in. I think it's in open tracing, but I can't track it down enough to break the ticket yet. You shouldn't have to put that on that up there. But for some reason, when you start your tracing at Micronaut, it doesn't work with Zipkin if you don't have enough. But if you use Edge, the Edge service, that's why the rabbit is on the Edge, because it wraps it up in here. Uh, okay. I was just hoping people wouldn't run into that because I don't like being like it's a bug but I can't fix it and I have no idea where it is. I have a general sense. There's, a, there's also a bug in spring security that's haunted me for the last years. That's vinegar hats right now. And people keep complaining about it. I was like, can't do that. It's, it's impossible. <laughs> Uh, 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 
easiest to. I think that's just saying that's about it. Which one do you want? It's cool. Yeah. 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 Rat pack. I thought this is the spray. Rat pack. Yeah. 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 Oh, no. They changed the thing. No, no. They changed the thing. And don't explain it. It's just really expensive. Yeah, V2 is better. But they both work. When wrong. So V1 and V2 uh, will both work to transport to Zipkin still, so it doesn't actually matter. It's actually not running, right? You just make the common guy that's going to have to do something. So, which part of the list is Thank you. 
So Zipkin is all about giving you the latency graph of everything, but since to do a latency graph you have to know all the steps, it actually tells you all the errors too. And the interesting thing is it becomes a really easy way, so if you do the lab too, if you go and look at some traces as you start exercising it, you will you should be able to find a couple really like egregious bugs in there. So there's injected bugs that you can debug really easily in Lab 2 that I injected. So if you run a trace, you'll see, hey, why did I get a 404 here? And then you can see where it was going. It's really obvious that's wrong. 
it's a really nice way to like do that. Uh, Zipkit in general is also allows you to add custom things. So you can customize your spans and traces. So once you got traces flowing into Zipkin, the next thing to do is to customize them. So what we do is for all of our OAuth clients when they're coming in, we actually add the OAuth client ID to this trace so that we can look up all the traces for a particular client ID and see if they have a higher percent of failures. So like you can do this kind of meta analysis. We can also look and see like, oh yeah, this whole like graph is happening and it, it matters. And it ties together our entire system, which we like. Start with submitting requests to the edge uh, service. Yeah. Try all the gits too. One of them will fail. And it'll fail in a really like obvious way.
with some browsers in Zipkin where you're going to have to like control refresh a lot. I don't know why. Whatever the shift, whatever on that button. It, it doesn't seem to stick around, but... Half a simple problem, by the way, kind of stuck. Okay. So, okay, basically, we have okay. all the projects running. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're trying to save something here. Yes. So, first thing to do, go to one of the projects, like root. So, when they run, they tell you where they're running. So that, like, one of them's going to run on. Yep. That's perfect. So that, what I'm saying though is, when you go there, that should, if you're tracing the setup right, you should see traces in Zipkin then. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> so let's, let me see. Do I need to configure or something? You want to connect the application? Yeah. Yep, that's a point. Yeah. So, so you got cut off. Now in, if you look in that group, that group. <laughs> There's, yeah, you're going to have to add something that binds wrap path. I'm sorry, break to it. So if you look at the, the uh, scroll down a little bit, there's the, somewhere there's this task.ask that point there. Open that up. <laughs> yeah, if you Google Brave Rat Pack, you'll find it. Oh, this is a hint of the project resides on the disk. It, and it's the, it will have the exact instructions to add it to zip uh, to wrap back. It has everything there. Try, let's just try it. Yes, so I should make those links, is what you're saying. Yeah. 
Questo non è vero, ma non è Okay, so I'm going to stay here for because the, the example's in Java and we're using Ruby, so there's a little syntax that's different. So let's do that together. So go back to that page. Did you copy? Copy where it says module down to, uh, to the end of it. Uh, no, the end is that. Yeah. And that goes into the binding section. <laughs> and then get rid of that dot in front of module. Yeah. And then that needs to be a Ruby style lambda. That's a Java style lambda. So move the config arrow inside the the curly. Get rid of that. It goes in there. That one. Nope. Yeah. So that goes right there. Oh, that's config. Lord. No, it's because I'm sitting there. That's all over. Oh, yeah, no, totally. All right, so that gives you most of it. Now you need to import server tracing on wall. And sampler. Yep. And now you need to read lower in the page on the Google page. Yeah. So it says you need span a span recorder. Uh, if you keep going down, you're going to... A span reporter is the thing that actually takes the spans from your tracer. So from your application and sends them to Zipkin. So it's the thing that's going to deliver them. So keep going down. There's, there's, I know which one you want to use, so keep going down. You just want um, that one. And then, so you can just do that uh, above module, because yeah. you're going to use it inside of the module, so, yeah. Uh, and then I think that oh uh, change the percent s to uh, there's percent s that should just be uh, local. Well one twenty seven there is one. This is local. 1.7001. It's got to be the loop not the loop. So, uh, backspace, backspace. 1, 2, 7. Okay. <laughs> it can't be localhost because Ubuntu doesn't like that. Uh, zero. No, it says you should go my computer and it does Zero. Oh, that one. Uh, one more zero. And then dot. There you go. Okay. That should be fine. And then basically report put reporter. Well, get rid of span reporter. That one's deprecated, right? Okay. Yeah, delete that. Now do dot at the end. Yep. And span. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Span. See where all the complaints. Oh, come on. Oh, I know why. I think. So it needs to log as well. And you want to do the span for V2, because you still have a V2 reporter. Ah, I did something. 
This was doing format, so you can get rid of the page. That is that that's the 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 so instead of doing string format, you just know the string. Yeah. So you're not doing that as like a config. You're not doing this as a config. So if you were doing it as a config, you'd want it to be just like get more careful. Yeah, let's try this. Cool. Let's just run the book. Do you want to see that again? There's one more thing you're missing. Yeah, there's one more. You're missing, if you go back to IntelliJ. No, you're good. Try, yeah, rerun this Gradle. It'll tell you. So just knowing that that should be a great I think a few seconds. Yeah, that was right. So I'm saying give it five to ten seconds to try again. So I'm not sure I'm going to try this thing. It's fine. No, because if you ran... Oh, uh, this is edge. Yeah, no, that's the wrong one. It's 50. You have to restart edge. Yeah, no, that's the wrong one. It's 50. You have to restart edge. There we go. Show off the more confident. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but your name is Red Rat Pack Demo. <laughs> but there you go! <laughs> I can show things. Sorry, I just told the post the problem of the project. Sorry about that. My computer crashed and then it was my computer crashed and then it didn't deal with that. It was working. So I thought I would show everyone a little bit of what they should see from the reports and traces. Once you have everything running, you're going to start getting these kind of traces that you can look at through in ZipKit. In your lab, too, there are a few bugs that should jump out right away and, and basically things that look like these big red ones. And you should be able to debug those really easily. I'm running the answer so we can get a sense of what it looks like. So this is an example of something that you'll notice we have a call out to Edge. You can see it call into the report service, and then it calls into hubs. But look at this big lag between between there. So that's why the visualization of this is really nice, because it's really easy to, to pick out visually where you want to go look. So in this case, it's our report service. And the question is, what's going on in here? Like, what's taking so long? It's taking almost 100 milliseconds to, like, to go and do this work. So the question is why? More than likely, this is the first time we've hit this thing, 
and the, the JVM wasn't hot. So if we keep hitting it, it'll go down. Uh, because this like oddly long one, and that happens to be Micronaut, I know it's probably just a cold JVM issue. But I know that because I know these services. Uh, this is where you can go in here, you can get lots of details. You'll see where uh, I've also, on Edge, started adding other things. So I started adding the version. So I, you can add whatever you like with a spam customizer. So you can add potentially new data that lets you then search on it to get what kind of insights you want to get. Did everyone feel, did everyone get the Micronaut tracing working at least? Most people got Micronaut working? Because that one's really, like, easy. <laughs> then, then Rat Pack. And then, did anyone get like Rails tracing working? Because I couldn't get it working correctly. And I ended up writing basically my own brain implementation uh, with, with an interceptor. So what happens is whenever you need to adapt something that doesn't have a good interceptor, you can use Brave if you're on the JVM. And it deals with all of the transport to Zipkin and all of that. All you have to do is plug into translating the calls into your service into like spans and collections inside of there. So if we want, if you want to look at that code, oh, I don't have IntelliJ. I'll start IntelliJ and I'll show you the code. Yeah. We got the 404 from the edge calling Rails, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. <coughs> It doesn't look like it's, oh, it's not logging the Micronaut, or the Grails yeah. for error, but it's logging it from the edge side. Yeah, because it doesn't know, like, if you got a 404, it never went in in Grails, it never, the way the Grails tracing works, there won't be any anything there because it never executes anything to 404. In, because I wrote naive tracing for Rails, because I couldn't get the real sleuth. So if you're using Spring Boot, there's something called Sleuth, which uses Zipkit and as far as Spring Cloud and works really, really well. And then it does a whole lot of really detailed tracing for you. And it used, yeah. So if we look at the lab two inserts for Rails. There's a logging interceptor that I tacked onto, and this is where I'm setting up my own HTTP tracer and basically starting traces. So when I do this, like this, all this work to start a trace is not something you should have to do. This is all something that should be done by a bigger implementation library. That's why Brave, uh, the Brave Rat Pack plugs right in, you're just plugging a module in, you're figuring it, but it deals with hooking into all the ins and outs of, of Rat Pack. You'll also note if you, in Rat Pack, I'm going to show the edge. If you, if you change your classes <coughs> so that you're asking for a Zipkin HTTP client, if you have this, this will make sure that it's an HTTP client that knows how to send it on. And that's how you'll start ending up and getting traces that look like this, where you have edge, report, and hub. Kind of all, and that's that same trace all propagating for you. In Micronaut, you get all of that for free. It knows how to hook into all of its own clients and just automatically makes them zip through clients. And it's using something called the B3 headers. So there's a spec, you can look them up, look up B3 headers, and it has a very detailed spec of how to pass trace context along each other.
Does anyone remember how to do it? Spash, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to close everyone. Oh, I'm going to close everyone. I'm going to close everyone. I'm going to close everyone. Try to wrap up tracing. It's kind of the next step after correlation IDs. It's much more advanced. You can do a lot more interesting things. But this is just like the basics of tracing. Once you get your basics of tracing in, the next level up from that is you can look at something called Haystack. It's or some of the other vendor uh, systems. Haystack actually does post processing on all your traces, and so you can do anomaly drip detection and drift detection and things like that to say, over time, month over month, I see all of my latencies are going up. Or you see like trends, and you can do that in like, long tail analysis on, your, on all your trace data. And Haystack does some really cool stuff with that. So that's a, and it plugs into, so Haystack sits on top and will read Zipkin data. But it's a cool thing to look at. In particular though, custom, customization is key. If you, let's see, where did I put? In the re in this main, I made this all handler that is always customizing. It's using a span customizer to tag the spans. So this is where you can add whatever data you want to the spans to have more context when you're looking at the latencies. For us, uh, we do a lot of things that have to do with what client it is involved, what client's talking to us, what versions of the API are they using, uh, because we, we support multiple <coughs> versions at once, so this is way more interesting for us. Uh, if we have late, low, late, low or high latency on particular versions, it's really, it's really good to know that, because the effects are, if it's a, the newest version, the effects are probably very low. If it's like a middle version, we care a lot, because it's probably the majority of our clients are suddenly like, hitting this like, latency issue. So after you do customization, um, the big question is when to use an annotation versus when to use a tag. So a tag is something that you can put a little piece of data onto the, the, the thing. So that's where I have this version and it has a V1. You're now able to search in the Zipkin UI. You'll be able to search by in this here, you can actually search by this like version one, you can do HTTP URL, so if you want to look to see if you have slow, an external query that's really slow, like it's a vendor, you can look up there. Uh, annotations will actually show up more inside, when you go in here, annotations will show up in here. So in between those two, uh, server start and server finish, anytime you have a point in time that something's happening, but not a span, you can, you can trigger an annotation on the span and it'll make points and it'll just fill in in there. So a good example is for my near caches, when I have an on process near cache, like blog cache, I'll actually put cache hit and cache miss as, as like points in time instead of making a span. And then I do spans for the uh, far caching. The last thing I wanted to touch on was service meshes. If you're starting to look at a service mesh, Zip knows what knows what a service mesh is. Anyone? Okay, I will try to explain a service mesh in no time. Uh, a service mesh is basically this idea of a sidecar or a process that is going to do all of your proxy work to the rest of your microservice ecosystem. So you only talk to this local little sidecar, it talks to everywhere else. So because of like uh, Ishto and things like that, they're getting really popular, those sidecars then do tracing for you. And they know a lot more detail about like who you are and 
all this stuff that we kind of build in naturally, they know and they can do. And they can also do things like uh, after the fact tracing. So they can decide after an error happens to tell all of these like sidecars, oh wait, this thing that you weren't keeping, but you kept in memory for like an hour or less, please send it in now. It's, it's, it's important. And so there's more coordination. Service mesh is really interesting, you, but tracing is something you can get without using a service mesh. And a service mesh is a really like, big step. If you're starting from scratch, you should totally look at it. If you're evolving your architecture, it's a lot harder to jump into something like a service mesh. But it's something you, it's becoming more popular and it's really found, it has some foundations in distributed tracing. So I thought it's good to know. <sighs> Lab three, metrics. Um, at this point, I want to kind of open it up for people to try either Lab three or Lab four, whichever you're more interested in. Lab four, I injected a bunch of failures in the observability code itself. So if you go, the app should be working correctly. So if you go and like do requests against the edge. Those should be working correctly, but if you go and look at your logs or your metrics or your zipkin, it will look wrong. Because I injected failures at the at the observability layer. So that there's a whole class of bugs that happen there in that lab. So that's kind of fun to work on if you want to try that one. Otherwise, lab three is about figuring out how to add metrics to to these systems. Uh, I have it set up with uh, Grafana and uh, Prometheus. So all of that's set up and will work, but in the task there's some weird stuff you have to do with Docker to make it all work, right? So that one can be a bit of a challenge. And then I just think Lab 4 is really interesting, and we have, I, if I'm reading my watch right, 25 minutes left, right? So we got about 25 minutes left. I would love for you all to have a little time to work on those. And other than that, I wanted to talk about um, some of the like horrible things we've broken in production, and just like those horror stories and share those. Um, I'm happy to share those. We got 20 minutes. If you have questions, I think it's a really good time to ask them. Otherwise, feel free to dig into either lab, and I'll try to help with either one. I will say Grails and metrics right now is not in a good place. Unless you know way more about Spring Boot and Grails or Milestone 2 and can make that work better, Prometheus and it are not getting along right now. I think you could make it work with like a, stat, a stats D implementation. Also, if I use a lot of words that no one knows, I'm happy to go over them. Isn't this about uh, natural? Because uh, Spring Group has uh, made significant progress on uh, metrics from one dot something to two dot something. And this is the grand question that I've just incorporated. That's what I thought. Uh, I can't get anything to show up. So you can totally make the metrics work if you aren't using Prometheus. So the yeah, weird, does everyone know how Prometheus works? OK. So. Thank you for asking. Prometheus is set up so it will actually reach out and scrape uh, endpoints. So it's going to call out to servers and read in endpoints. Now that's that's way different than like a stats D where your services are pushing. So because of that, in the lab, there's some notes about how to make that actually work getting around Docker sockets. Because Prometheus is running in Docker and everything else is running locally, so you do some funny things and it works. But that means in Grails, we have to expose an endpoint that it has all of these metrics. So Micronaut also doesn't work with it out of the box with its current version, but there is a post that tells you exactly how to make it work by just exposing that. Rat Pack has a completely working version of Prometheus that is not documented at all, and unless you know to go read the pull request that it added it, it's really hard to find. But it works. <laughs> so, Prometheus is. Yeah. Uh, 
Prometheus is really interesting. I can't personally say that I would use it this way in production. I think I would have something where a, you push to stats D and then have Prometheus read from a stats D like aggregator, but that's me. So, have at it, I'll help you. Please think of feedback. What things should I change? I got more hints that are a little clearer about like where to start on some of the problems was a big one. Uh, probably breaking up lab one, it sounds like, would be good into some smaller chunks. If there's other things, if there's areas that I missed, let me know. I want to add them. Thanks. So we'll have time, I'll be here. Also, if you're done with this, feel free to go. I understand. Yeah, so, so just the, be a little clear. The, here's what the objective is for this step. My yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And I, the first time I wrote them, they basically gave away all the right. answers. Right, I get it. <laughs> it was like, oh, this was five minutes. Right. Uh, so, I, yeah, I want to do that, and I want to also find a way to what I did, which <laughs> it got lost in the shuffle. Um, I had a set of great of like actual endpoints to hit that actually exercised the whole graph. And so there was like, I think making that like a little like uh, make file or something that shows you that. I try, I did functional tests at one point, but that was too easy because that showed you exactly where the bug was. Right. It's like, oh, I missed it exactly right there. And then because the systems are small enough that the, the tracing and everything is you can solve most of these with a good set of tests. <laughs> Oh, I have a terrible chip on. Actually, I'm, I'm 
doesn't even have shoes. It's just on or Well, I guess so is mine, but it's a Ryzen, which are supposed to be decent on board graphics. I have a 32 gig processor, I have a machine and a processor, and I have a Chrome yeah, sales set for this thing. Yeah. Really tough. And if it wasn't for the desk tools, I would have stopped using it. I'm slowly switching to Firefox. Are you? I guess I probably could, because being in a game source now, it's not fun to be in the level of debugging that I used to do with the old time set of being in desk tools. So if anyone's interested, I'm going to just poke around Zipkin up here in my prod account if you want to see it. I used to, I put on my phone. So this one's set up so it actually traces all the way into Cassandra. So you, you see the Cassandra query, <laughs> what data center I ran on. So this is the kind of stuff you tag spans with. <coughs> so this is a span that's just around the database query, and then it has all the details of exactly like where it's happening. Some other interesting ones are, uh, okay, this one's fixed. Um, for a while there was, we did a naive implementation of Spring Security, and you would go and look in here and you'd see the three of the same query over and over again. And it, what it was is Spring Security expected you to have a cache layer in place, and we didn't. So it wasn't passing around uh, one of the OAuth like clients. It was just like doing a kit on the repository every time, assuming you had a near cache. And we didn't have one, and so you just see the Cassandra like triple low for no reason. So yeah, they're they're different. Um, this is so we check token at every hop. So this is starts at our edge of our graph, gets locations, checks the token, then account service is actually checking that token, and then you'll notice that this happens after this one. So this is like one call stack, and then you pull it away, and then you see this next one happen, which is one which is like everything else. And then it goes down into, this is like async processing kicking off. I hope so. Uh, that's where? Oh, milliseconds. That's 1. <laughs> milliseconds. Uh, this is actually fast. This is less than 100 milliseconds total. Uh, the other thing that's coming is a new UI for Zipkin. So this is the same thing in the new UI, which people tend to like the new UI better. A little easier to see what's going on. Yeah, basically everyone wants things to look the same. <laughs> it's not bad, it's only when it's they change shit before you even get used to the previous version. Yeah, yeah. Nice different Android versions. Right. They just I just the, learned where to look for that. Yeah, you know? they just changed the camera app and everything's suddenly different in there. Oh, mm -hmm. So here's our dependency graph. So basically, we're getting it's all laid out. There is a lot more to it. When the RT graph is an AP hot problem. But you can do things like click and then see error counts, where they're from, what the breakdown of all the calls are. So oh, that one. That's 
some people find this graph really useful. I just show it to higher ups to scare them. Here's why you can't fire me. Oh no, you can fire me, that's fine. <laughs> if I'm doing my job right, I'm replaceable within a week. <laughs> oh, I do, all the time. They usually... So you're telling them you're not doing your job right? No, my job to be right is that anyone else can pick up my, pick up my work and move on. <laughs> There's always one piece that you hold out for. No, it's just that no one wants my pieces. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that it's, uh, yeah. But, yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting things. So far, in my entire job, I'm the only one who knows how to start the automation process. <laughs> <laughs> Even automation needs maintenance. That's right. I need someone to start it. Free go. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's the worst war story you have? Uh, uh, that the so worst like observability horror story is uh, we had we have the idea of transactions start the platform and they come in like a motion sensor happened in someone's house. We then run automations that say, when a motion turns on, turn on a light. We then go and make a call to turn on a light. That is still the same transaction, right? So we then have an automation that says, oh, when the light turns on, go turn on this other light. And so still the same transaction. And then that light says, hey, I need to match the level of this light. And so what happens is you have this cycle that's not a true cycle, but it's basically because in the firmware of certain lights, it decides that it wants to ramp. When you tell it to turn on at 80%, it'll slowly ramp up to 80%. And then you have an automation that says, I want my lights between these two to always match. So whenever you dim one, you want the other one to match it. So as this is turning on and ramping up, this one light keeps adjusting itself. And then all of this ended up being the same Zipkin trace. Because we're like, well, it's all happening. It's all like we kept propagating the trace. So we kept making these cycles in our system, which we're okay with the cycle happening. But we're not okay with, we have to figure out a way of when to stop the tracing. Like, when's that breaking point to say, okay, this is the end of the transaction. Anything after it's a new transaction. Even though it was caused by this other thing, we don't want this, like, infinite growth of a trace. But yeah, we so like we made it so that a couple things had so many uh, spans that you couldn't open Zipkin because it was like ridiculous numbers. Uh, we use Cassandra for our Zipkin backing, and we use uh, Cassandra 311 with the SASE indexes. So there was a fix to the SASE indexes, and so they went from like. I think they had an 80% reduction in disk volume after we did their like fix. Just ridiculously high. We run a 30 node Cassandra cluster uh, to back just our tracing. Do you have a lot of money? What? Do you have a lot, a lot of money? Yeah. <laughs> we do. Uh, so what we're doing today, though, is we're really driving hard to, to take all of these observability metrics and the cost of them and then plot that against um, business metric and say overall cost sh should be a percentage, a known percentage of operating our platform. And we have to like keep it in line. And right now we're under that. So it's okay. It's just, we're, yeah. We, we work at a scale that's hard to talk about. And then you talk to people like Netflix and they just make you feel like, oh, why am I even bothering? <laughs> yeah, my wife loses her mind if they go down for 30 seconds. People don't appreciate what it takes to do the thing. Yeah, no one does. I was once at a talk by Twitter talking about reliability and they were like, yeah, we're not Netflix, we can't do that. And I'm like, 
weird strata there. Is anyone running metric like who's who's using metrics in Broad? What are you all using? Statsd. Hmm? The Statsd. Oh, just Statsd. Yeah. And then what does it go to? Okay. okay. We use Prometheus. Okay. Does it scale well? It just feels like you have this pain in the ass of like trying to get it to hit all boxes. We haven't uh, we haven't hit the uh, the limit yet. So okay. Hard work. But, but part of our our scalability is also we have multiple clusters, and because of PCI DSS combines, ah, we just run, run yet another uh, <laughs> service there. There, so you said PCI, and I'm just like, well, I'm leaving now. Okay. Anyone else doing metrics in Prague? All right, do metrics. They're great. Uh, I don't work for a company. <laughs> I feel like some people. I mean, I'm an evangelist. There's no way. There's nothing for me to do metrics. Sure, there is. <laughs> if you you could have if you have met, if you have metrics and observability built into all your like our demos and things like that, uh, you can look at when people are using them and like kind of get that feedback. If or I expose my demos. That would be yeah. Nice. But I, most of my demos are. Yeah, we we've started to do a lot of business metrics now. So instead of just focusing on metrics that are like what's your like uh, latency uptime like percentiles, we'll have uh, metrics that are like business transactions completed, things like that, and then we can graph those in data. We use Datadog heavily. Graph those with Datadog against things like operational cost, and that's where we can say this this much platform use is okay for operational costs. They have this like correlation. I don't know. We it involved linear regressions at one point constantly. So. Because I didn't get it. I just got my best. Hey, you know, I'm like, just, is it what the next step is? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it's doing that, <laughs> but as long as it's showing you what you think it should be showing. So, what are you using on Cradle Enterprise? Just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, we don't have a single production server. We have a single 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 server. We have a We they are not very fast. So AWS Cloud Watch metrics are exceedingly slow. Five to ten, five to ten minute lag time. And that's not good enough. No. No, uh, mm -hmm. five to ten minute lag time uh, means it's five to ten minutes before triggering on work. That's how that's how slow cloud watch is. Yeah, no, we have we use uh, Datadog because of how fast it is. We have Datadog routes directly into big drops. We we have a rather slow SLA for how fast it needs to be paged so get up from a page. So 24 7 the developer has to answer a page within 15 minutes. Otherwise, it's an SLA breach. And so, like, we do a lot of like really proactive uh, monitoring, knowing that that much goes. I don't know. We've never been able to get like better than 15 minutes SLA. We're done. Done. So we have one quarter of an hour for the coffee break. So let's go out. Now just to have a coffee and then get back here for Yeah, we'll be, we'll be good time.